Thank you so much for joining us for session three, which is entitled Global Citizenship. My name is Alicia Montague, and I will be your moderator for this session. We have five speakers in this session today. First up is Kathleen Bagley with co-presenters Dr. Cheryl L. Rosenthal and Marla Raucher Osborne presenting on Work That Changes Minds, Women's Travel Writing and International Projects. Next, we have Carla Cabrera Cuadrado, who will be presenting an introduction to the Golden Circle of Public Diplomacy, followed by Andreas DeWalt, who will be speaking about moving from inspiring conversations to collaborative action. Then we have Trang Day, Glassy Tran Nguyen, presenting a Fulbright Global Garden, cultivating home in Stockholm and in the world. And last but not least, we have Joseph Reynolds presenting Belonging on the Frontier, a photographic study of the creation of place in Crystallandia, Brazil. All of our speakers will present their topic, then we'll leave about 20 to 25 minutes for Q&A. Thank you and welcome to my presentation, an introduction to the Golden Circle of Public Diplomacy. A little bit about me. I did my Fulbright in Washington, D.C., where I studied a master's in intercultural communication, which led me to start the PhD that I'm doing today, focusing my research on Spain's public diplomacy in the United States. What you can see now is just the beginning of my research on public diplomacy. The model I'm going to present today is the Golden Circle of Public Diplomacy, which merges the core ideas of two other theories. First one is Simon Sinek's leadership theory, the Golden Circle, and the second one is Simon Anhold's foreign affairs theory, the good country equation. After merging that, I added a few layers to complete the model for analysis and strategy building. For those who don't know the Golden Circle by Simon Sinek, this is a theory that Simon Sinek created by studying what motivated individuals and applied it to companies for long-term success and loyalty. So to give you a brief introduction of how this circle works in business environments, the what refers to the product. In the case of Vans, the company, the product is sports shoes for skaters. The how, the second layer, is the process, is the less tangible part of the company, and it refers to how they do things different. Vans, for example, can be differentiated by their technological advances to make shoes more comfortable and resistant when skating apart from their innovative design. The core center is the why, the purpose, why the company is doing what they're doing. They're not doing this for profit or benefit, it's just a result. They have a further course. Vans is promoting the skating lifestyle. They do not only sell shoes, but they sponsor skateboarding competitions. They open skate parks all over the world. They do documentaries so you can learn more about the skateboarding history. It goes beyond making profit. The second theory that I'm using in my model is the good country equation by Simon Anhol. What Simon Anhol says is that countries need to be good and collaborative to have a good image in the world. You might remember Simon Anhol from the Nation Brand Index, as he was the one that created it, that has studied the image that countries had all over the world. But after advising a lot of international governments, he realized that branding was not a very appropriate term for a successful strategy. And he decided to create the Good Country Index where he measures the contributions of all countries to the well-being of the society. Because what countries need to do is to collaborate and compete against common international enemies, such as poverty or, or climate change. Therefore, these two men, what they advocate for is that human behavior cannot be manipulated. It needs to be inspired by admirable companies or countries that go beyond the simple fact of making profit or managing the international environment. Therefore, I created my own golden circle of public diplomacy where you can find the three original layers, why, how, and what, and the additional three that I added to this model 
to have a more complete vision of a public diplomacy strategy, which we'll see later. We'll start with the classic dimensions. Here you can see the concepts that I equated to the original classic dimensions, and we're going to see them in detail now. The what, in the case of countries, I equated it to public diplomacy. So I'm sure all of you have an idea of what public diplomacy is, but what I did was focusing on the three main areas that public diplomacy is conducted, which is information, education, and culture. According to Nicole, these concepts are translated to public diplomacy into international broadcasting, exchange diplomacy, and cultural diplomacy. Definitely, you know examples from international broadcasting, such as Voice of America, Al Jazeera, exchange diplomacy, we all know, Fulbright program, and cultural diplomacy. I put you here an example with a picture of the House of Sweden, as I'll use Sweden as an example for the next three layers that I'm going to be explaining today. The House of Sweden is a cultural exhibition of Swedish values with this architectural piece that reflects Sweden and their society, which we'll see in the next slide with how countries should do public diplomacy. Well, that's with soft power. Soft power is what makes them attractive through their cultural values, political values, and policies. Therefore, Sweden, with this architectural piece, is showing its values of openness, transparency, democracy, and collaboration, and it's reflected in their classes and the way they are organizing events, how it's open to the public. So everything that is done by the country needs to be reflected in those actions. But where does it come from? That comes from the core moral purpose that the country needs to have when conducting public diplomacy and in their foreign affairs. It's not just managing the international environment, being a regional leader or world domination. You know, that's only a consequence of what your purpose is achieving. You know, the purpose, the why should be ending poverty, fighting climate change, democratizing the world. Continuing with the example of Sweden, I put here Greta Thunberg, who is a clear ambassador of the country because represents the values of the country and the why and the cause that the country wants to be identified with. So apart from these three layers, I also added three more that I thought were definitely needed in this context to be able to have a successful strategy. Coming from an intercultural studies background, I definitely found a lack of cultural studies applied to public diplomacy. As you can see in this slide, there are a lot of cultural models that have been created since the early 1920s with the American diplomat Edward Hall, with interculturalists like Hofstede, Trumpeners, the Globe Study in Business, Erin Mayer. All of them have several cultural dimensions and only two of those cultural dimensions have been applied to public diplomacy research which is mostly Western and it's completely oblivious to cultural differences. Therefore, what I suggest in this model is to add a layer of where, which refers to the culture that we're dealing with. And to be culturally sensitive, I propose to create a cultural feasibility assessment where we compare the culture conducting PD and the culture receiving those programs in all the cultural dimensions available plus local advice that we won't find in these generic models. So the idea of this cultural facility assessment, it's not to highlight stereotypes or cultural supremacy, but to find cultural similarities where we can reach out to our audience and to point out possible challenges that might make our work more difficult out there. But culture in terms of geographical location is not everything. To the where I also needed to add who, which is the actors of the audience. For the sake of time, I won't talk about the actors today, but you can find it in my upcoming article. But I want to introduce the audience because 
summing narrative piece in this article is that I created this intersectional cultural dimensions that should be added to the cultural visibility assessment. Because as I said, geographical location is not the only difference between societies, but also within those societies, we have other intersectional dimensions where we find groups such as by generation, religion, race and ethnicity, regional typology, language, and a lot more that I have not really included because there's a lack of research or the research is confusing as it might happen with gender right now. Therefore, the idea is that we merge the cultural feasibility assessment with the intersectional assessment of all the both societies that we're analyzing so we can combine the results but never isolate them. Because if we isolate these factors and we focus on generation or religion without taking into account the cultural differences in, in the geographical locations, we might be making a mistake by overlooking a lot of cultural treats that we are not aware of. The last dimension that I'll just go through very quickly because we don't have time is when the last layer of the golden circle of public diplomacy. This is referring to time, of course, and there are three aspects that we need to take into account. If we are proactive versus reactive, if we plan long-term versus long-term programs, and if we use these programs isolated or with curiosity. So these three aspects are not mutually exclusive. They are combined and they are different combinations. We just need to take into account that all these aspects need to be present when preparing a public diplomacy program, communication, or strategy. So that was a very brief introduction to the golden circle of public diplomacy. A lot of more explanations, examples, and other detailed information about the golden circle of public diplomacy will be available in my upcoming article. So if you are interested, please don't hesitate to contact me. I just want to conclude with the thought that what we need is a more culturally sensitive and collaborative approach to public diplomacy to improve the well-being of, of the global society and not of individual countries. Thank you very much. Okay, hello. Everyone, um, it's an honor being here. My name is uh, Andreas de Wald. I'm uh, calling in from Germany, from the beautiful city of Berlin. And tonight I will talk about um, how we can move from inspiring conversation to collaborative action. I uh, currently work as a consultant for Deutsche Bahn, and um, I am also the president of the German Fulbright Alumni Association. And before we start, I would love to uh, you to go on a little thought experiment uh, with me and imagine you've been to an event, you've been to a conference and you've met um, many wonderful people, some of them might be Fulbrighters, and you think of an opportunity, um, you think of something that you would like to achieve collaboratively, um, or you see an opportunity and imagine what an impact uh, collaborative action could have to solve a complex challenge in your neighborhood, in your workplace or within your network. But oftentimes challenges arise and we start to think about limitations, problems um, like limited resources and time. Today I would like to share with you where I found an answer to this dilemma, how it works and how I put it into action to strengthen the Fulbright and transatlantic community in Germany. But first, let me give you um, a little background. Um, Oh, that was too far. All right, first, uh, let me give you a little background. Um, I did my, my Fulbright uh, at Purdue University in 2017-18, where I studied uh, technology, leadership, and innovation. And I had a wonderful experience there. At Purdue, I heard about strategic doing, which is the framework that I will talk about today, first uh, in a student workshop. And uh, I would love to now share this uh, problem-solving framework with you. Before we go into the framework, we need to um, start to set the stage with a little bit of an understanding of how transformation works. 
we all know this bell curve, um, there's growth, growth over time to up to a certain point, and then there's decline. And this applies to um, organisms, distributions, even our life. And uh, we want our birds, the things that we care about, uh, the companies, developments, etc., not to end, but uh, to continue. So we need to take a different approach uh, to the bell curve. If we look at the, the first part of the bell curve, um, it almost looks like an S. So in order to prevent sliding down the S curve on the other side, we need to jump to the next S. And this is where strategic doing comes in. Strategic doing enables people to achieve purposeful transformation by forming action-oriented collaborations quickly, moving them toward measurable outcomes and making adjustments along the way. This is the general uh, statement. And uh, now I will go into details what strategic doing is all about. And we look at, at strategy. We look at um, the usual questions that we ask ourselves when we want to achieve something, which is first, where are we going? What is our North Star? What is our goal? Um, and we define it. And then secondly, we need to um, look at how will we get there? What are the pathways? And strategic doing, um, or at Purdue, they took these two questions and they divided them up into four. And in order to answer the questions, where are we going? We ask two more questions, which is what could we do and what should we do? And this, um, this um, looks at the, the outcomes, linking, leveraging and aligning. And how will we get there? We need to ask ourselves the question, what will we do and what's our 30-30? And what that is, I'll explain later. We often turn to nature when we try to, to, to solve challenges that we have on our own. And um, strategic doing did the same thing. If you look at this, this really complex thing that is happening, a swarm that's majestically moving in different forms, um, we can break that down to only three simple rules. Basically, the birds flying in this swarm, they only follow three rules, which is don't fly too close to your neighbor, don't fly too far from, in, from your neighbor, and fly in the same general direction as your neighbor. So we can, we can describe um, something very complex in a very simple way. And strategic doing tries to do the same. Strategic doing has three simple rules and they have been um, discovered and articulated over uh, 25 years. And now we'll jump uh, right into, into action. And I would love to, to share with you the first four rules, which I think are the most vital and important ones in this framework. And that can really help us to move towards collaborative action. Rule number one is we need to create and maintain a safe space for deep and focused conversation. In order to really bring things forward, we need to make sure that we are not distracted, that we have we build uh, mutual trust and we have equity of voice. So we need to make sure that everyone who is in the conversation um, takes up about the same amount of time. The second rule is we need to frame our strategic conversation with the right question. This is very important because we move in the general direction of our conversation. So if we focus on problems and things that are not working, usually more problems arise and our conversation becomes problem focused. But what we need to do is we need to focus on opportunities. So we need to look um, at positive things and we try to, um, we try to yeah, um, have our immunization jump in and we try to see a future uh, where wonderful things happen. And what we did in our workshop um, working with the, with the other uh, associations was we answered the question, imagine the power of a united German-American alumni network that allowed us to accomplish more together than as individual associations. What would that look like? So this framing question guided us through the whole process and helped us to really um, move towards a future that is, was guided by opportunities and, and new things for us. Rule number three then says we need to uncover hidden assets that people are willing to share. And I think this is the key of strategic doing is that we uncover assets that people might not even 
knew that they were assets um, to them and could also be assets to us. And uh, these could be physical assets, skill and knowledge assets, network assets, and capital assets. And the beauty about this is that these assets are usually or should be directly accessible by the participants. So they have direct control over them, thus they are directly actionable. Once we've done that, we have a list of, of assets and um, from you know, various different backgrounds, people who come in with, with different skills. And what we do next is we try to link and leverage our new assets to create new opportunities. So we combine an, uh, um, a, a, a skill, a resource asset um, with maybe a capital asset, and we try to combine them in new ways. And what this does is um, there are new combinations are forming and th things that have previously not um, worked together, they now come together and they create new opportunities. And what this does is this really helps us to bridge um, that gap that we, that we have between the one S curve where the growth is slowing down. And that really helps us to kickstart, to jump onto the next S curve where um, we find new opportunities that bring us, um, that bring us further. Now, as time is running out, I need to quickly um, jump over um, these two slides and um, end my, my talk with presenting the, the rest of the rules, which is we next answer the question of what should we do? So we try to rank all those opportunities that we came up with and try to find our big easy. And the big easy is the idea or opportunity that is, uh, has the most impact and is easiest to implement. And then we convert that big easy into an outcome with measurable characteristics. We define a Pathfinder project with guideposts that guide us along the way. And we define a short uh, term action plan where everybody is taking a small step. This means that everyone is doing something little with maybe an hour of their time over the next 30 days. And then the 30 30 meeting is basically looking at the past 30 days and um, what went well, what needs to be. Um, what needs to be optimized and then you plan the next 30 days and then you set up the next meeting and you nudge connect and promote this new habit of collaboratively working together and now it's exactly 10 minutes and this is very short um, but I would love uh, to later answer some more questions and uh, feel free to contact me write me an email add me on LinkedIn and I'm looking forward to um, hopefully helping you um, with strategic doing to tackle a challenge that you might have. Thank you very much. Alicia, do I start now? Yes, 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 we can see you. You have oh, the floor. floor. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I was waiting for your cue. I just wanted to make sure that. So greetings everyone. Um, I would like to start by sharing my deepest thanks to the conference team for putting together this second virtual meeting. Um, let us rekindle the Fulbright vision 75 years after it was launched and has changed the world for the better. In this presentation, I invite you to reflect on your own Fulbright experience as I share my journey and perspectives that stem from my year in Sweden. Um, let us ponder together one question. How do we cultivate intra-selves and inter-selves in an ever evolving transnational world in search for a peaceful, sustainable and equal coexistence. 
uh, drawing from my uh, Fulbright experiences in Stockholm, I coined the concept of Fulbright Global Garden to illustrate how immersing in another culture is the ultimate way to cultivate a globalized sense of home within ourselves and with others. Uh, weaving the scholarly and the personal, I illuminate how the Fulbright year has, has shaped my scholarship and civic engagements and argue that today's global citizens must cultivate their garden, not just at home, but at home in the world. I focus on how home can be forged via a shared love for nature, humane immigration policies, and the illogics of situational communities. So following the transnational circuits of migration in the last 50 years, my Fulbright project examined um, Vietnamese life in Sweden. I conducted year-long ethnographic fieldwork, uh, archival research, and cross-lingual oral history interviews with Vietnamese immigrants in Stockholm and other parts of Sweden. Home in Stockholm was the first and only of its kind conducted on this population. Um, Jirang Sang recalled what immigration, uh, what an immigration officer was telling her at the refugee camps in the Philippines. We don't have sunlight for six months a year. As a boat person, she didn't have the luxury to choose the host country. So she went to Sweden thinking it would have been nice to go to the US. So for Vietnamese immigrants seeking a home in Stockholm with their hearts headed elsewhere, uh, this, the search might go on forever. On Sweden's note paths of wintry days, an immigrant from tropical Vietnam might feel foreign and lost. From environmental shifts to cultural isolation, the yellow exile is defined with ambivalence and anticipation. Their stories seem to be tales of disbelonging. But when these tales are wrapped in a deep and appreciation for Sweden's benevolence toward immigrants and refugees, the sense of home is deeply articulated. The contradiction of home takes back and forth between the disadvantages of a wintry locale and the gratitude for humane immigration policies. While the Vietnamese immigrants in Sweden acknowledge the various setbacks such as the cold weather and the language barrier, they express an eternal gratitude for the Swedish government and its humane policies. It is important to note the uneven global polity of immigration across history. As we witness the US withdrawal from Afghanistan and the economic meltdown in Lebanon and other recent world events, we are keenly aware and urgently reminded of the important need for humane immigration policies. In the case of Vietnamese immigrants and refugees in Sweden, their gratitude for the host country upon admission and during resettlement is immense. As uh, Sen, my informant, explained, we were families with either disabled members or too old or having too many children. So other countries rejected us, but Sweden took us in. This was our only chance." End of quote. While some Vietnamese in Sweden have relocated to other parts of the Vietnamese diaspora with warmer weather and larger Vietnamese enclaves such as Orange County, California, the majority told me that Sweden is their home. They appreciated the peaceful and orderly way of life. It gives them stability and a sense of home. They feel supported and cared for by the government. They are happy that their children received good education and social support. Though they continue to confront cultural exclusion, they feel that there are opportunities for the next generations. Situa situational communities. As Vietnamese immigrants resettle in a new country, their sense of home is intertwined with the human relations and social connections they can forge there. The human flows out of Vietnam since 1975 have resulted in large diaspora communities with established social organizations around the world. This was not the case in Sweden. The absence of cultural and social fabric can prompt depression among newcomers. In the Vietnamese diaspora, Sweden seems to be on the periphery. Some scholars even wonder if there are Vietnamese living there. This could be due to the small number of Vietnamese immigrants who are also scattered across Sweden, making them less visible. But my fieldwork shows that people adapt and create what I call situational community with all of its logics or lack thereof, where the structure or organization might be flexible and organic. One such, such case was when Vietnamese students across Scandinavia countries met up in Uppsala in 2005 
for the river rafting event. This is an annual event organized by the Uppsala Union of Engineering and Science Students. As I engaged in conversations with Vietnamese students from Finland, Norway, and Sweden, I ran into my Romanian and Malaysian dorm mates from Lapis, Stockholm University. For me, the Uppsala event brought together a multi-layered community of festive and energetic participants who might not see each other again, but did belong to one single activity on that day. I reflected on how, though my research project focuses on Vietnamese immigrants, it need not be confined to the discourses of this ethnic group alone. In fact, it is even more important to study the connections they make with the host country and the local population in their search for home. Therefore, the sense of home and community can be extended to encompass the collective human interactions beyond the constraints of ethnicity or social structure. Another situational community I found was at the 52nd Berlin Fulbright Seminar in March 2005, where Fulbrighters gathered to share our research and cultures. It was a feast of Fulbright ideas and findings. I was in awe. I had never met as many Fulbrighters in my life as I did in Berlin. But what really hit home for me was when I reflected on the history of division that played out in the city of Berlin. I asked city officials about the strategies and programs that helped Berlin bridge the east-west political divide, drawing from my personal experience of the north-south division in Vietnam. I felt a deep connection with Berlin because of these shared historical experiences. So after a year in our Fulbright country, we are back home or remain in our Fulbright country as our new home. And the mission to spread the Fulbright message and to foster international understanding continues. In a Fulbright lecture at Cal State Fulton in 2005, I urged the audience to be cultural ambassadors and promote cultural cross-cultural understanding wherever they were in which capaci capacity they're in, even if they were not formal Fulbrighters. Today, here in Southern California, I am blessed with the diverse expressions of world cultures, but as environmental crises and extreme weather have unfortunately become a part of our daily lives, there is an urgent call to build sustainable communities. Greta Thunberg's environmental activism is quintessential of Swedish culture. In January 2005, I presented at a conference hosted by CEDA, the Swedish International Development Authority. I asked a Swedish scholar sitting next to me. What do you think is the most salient trait in Swedish culture? He took his time, thought for a long time, and then told me, the love for nature. It can be hard for immigrants to engage culturally in Swedish society, given the typical private way of life, but there might be a very good way to crack the cultural distance by participating and sharing in the love for and protection of nature that is omnipresent and central to this Scandinavian country. And it's a good match because Vietnamese immigrants everywhere carry with them one thing in common. No, it's not the language or the culture, which can manifest in different forms. It's their green thumbs. A Vietnamese home can quickly be identified by the flora around it. <clears throat> by way of conclusion, I'd like to return to the question I raised at the beginning and offer some thoughts how do we, about how we can cultivate um, a peaceful, sustainable, equal coexistence. One, we can help promote humane immigration policies whenever we can, knowing that immigration is a complex process. Just two days ago, the Fulbright Association issued an advocacy action alert calling for support of a new bill, HR 5482, which will direct the State Department to issue special immigrant visas to Afghan alumni so that they and their families can escape persecution and relocate to or stay in the United States. Let's take one minute to fill out the form and help Fulbright Afghan alumni. In the number two, practice situational communities that enable peaceful connections and understanding across cultures continue to grow a global heart, act as a cultural ambassador beyond your Fulbright year, raise the next generations of Fulbrighters, live out the Fulbright spirit wherever you are. And three, nurture the love for nature in the generations today and tomorrow. Act green, advocate for environmental justice, instill deep love and timely care for Mother Earth in your community 
and home. My best wishes to you as you cultivate your Fulbright Global Garden and thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much. Um, Joseph, when you're ready, please um, just share your screen and turn your audio on. Hello, everyone. My name is Joe Reynolds, and I'm a photographer based in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. And all right, here we go. Uh, so today I'll be sharing a project uh, called In Communion with Soil. Uh, the longer title is called Belonging on the Frontier, a photographic study of the creation of place in Cristalonia, Brazil. Um, this project started in 2008 as a collaboration with the middle school students of Cristalonia through a grant from East Tennessee State University. Uh, then it continued as a collaboration with the high school students there through a Fulbright grant. Uh, and next year, COVID, COVID permitting, of course, it will continue as a, um, as a collaboration with the regional university students there through another Fulbright grant. Uh, next year, I hope to be working with a geography professor uh, who is also from Cristalandia. Um, through these years, I've realized that I've been asking geography questions all along. So she and I will be comparing how we've used, we've, uh, used different methods to ask similar questions about Cristalandia. Uh, the project itself centers around me. Uh, I am a Brazilian who has never lived in Brazil. My mom was born in Sao Paulo and my dad was born here in Tennessee where my, brother's not, my brother and I were also born. Uh, so my mom growing up was determined that her two sons would have a direct relationship with her family and culture without the need of a translator. So she taught us Portuguese since birth. She gave us dual citizenship. She infused our household with Brazilian culture. And she took us on as many trips as possible to visit family, including various bus tours all around the country. So I felt very Brazilian growing up, except when I, when I got to Brazil, my uncle called me out in particular. He said I was still a foreigner because he said, if you go to a bar and you start to talk to people there, you're not gonna understand the local politics and you're not gonna even know yesterday's sports scores. So he was right. What I didn't have was a direct relationship with daily life. I only had an indirect relationship through the perspective of a tourist and through the viewpoint of my mom as the guide who was setting up our trips. What I needed then was a place to where I could erase these relationships as best I could and start from scratch. And I could observe how relationships are built and then decide for myself whether I am or am not a Brazilian. So she helped me find this little town, Cristalandia, where she had been doing some social work. And she knew some people there, but not too many only enough to get set up with a host family and my collaborators. Uh, there, I could, as best po as possible, be essentially anonymous, and I could walk around town and watch how my relationships were growing as I engage with people. And my process is, has been simply that. I walk around town all day, and I photograph anything and everything I encounter. People, land, buildings, food, plants, whatever I find. And the question then becomes, as my relationships grow, does the imagery change too? Can I see an increased intimacy in the imagery that reflects the increased intimacy I'm feeling in the relationships that I'm developing? And so key to building these relationships has become the long exposure, which I stumbled onto by accident on the first trip. Uh, at the time, I'd been using what's called a slow film here in Tennessee to give me some more saturated colors. Uh, and this film works because it's not especially sensitive to light, which means you have to leave the camera open for a little bit longer than normal for the imagery to show up and all the light to come in the camera. But when I got to Brazil, I realized that I'd never used this film to photograph people. And so when I did, I realized that I was actually asking these people to sit still in front of the camera for a little bit longer than they were, they were used to. And they became a little uncomfortable with that, uh, about 10 seconds or more. So I noticed that the, the say cheese face quickly melted away after about a second or two. And what was left was a myriad of emotions. Basically, the public facade faded, and what was left was a private emotions. And I realized I was asking them to be in a very vulnerable state. And, but I was, in, in my own way, vulnerable as well, because there's no uh, photo lab in Crystalandia, much less in the, in, in the surrounding region there. 
So I had to wait until I got home in Tennessee to see the results of my pictures. So the entire time I'm there, I have really no way of knowing whether I'm making anything good or not. On, on top of that, there's a very high rate of failure with what I'm doing. And there are all kinds of technical failures that could go, that could go wrong, not to mention that I make a lot of boring pictures. So the only solution is to make a lot of pictures so that the percentages are increased that I might get a few good ones here and there. So I really had no way of knowing whether I'm making a good, a good picture or not. So a good picture could no longer be my motivation. I had to be motivated by something else. And that something else was the relationship that I could see evolving in front of me, right in front of the lens. So I expanded on this the next couple trips. And now I've been using a, what's called a view camera which is essentially the, the same thing as was used in the 19th century, that a uh, big camera with the cloth over your head that sits in a tripod. And this is a very mechanical camera. It requires a lot of steps just to set it up. So now I'm, not, I'm asking my subjects not just to sit with me during that 10 second exposure, but I'm asking them to engage with me during the minute or two that it takes to set up this camera. And as anybody who has done public speaking knows, it's a very vulnerable state when you start to recognize that you're your audience has disconnected with you. So the challenge I have is that I have to maintain connection with them the entire time of the photographing process. So my method now has been what I call trespassing with curiosity, which is basically meaning that I'm intentionally moving from the public space into the private space to create this relationship. Legally, I'm trespassing into private land because I recognize that the relationship that you have at a store is the salesman uh, client relationship. And that's a, that's a public relationship. That's not a private relationship. And so I intentionally need to go into people's, into people's backyards. And so I intentionally wander into people's backyards with the hope that they'll eventually come out and ask me, what are you doing? And that's my window for engaging in, in a conversation with them, which is exactly what I want. I want to talk to them. So trespassing legally and also trespassing emotionally, which I've already alluded to. I'm asking people to enter into a vulnerable state with me. I'm asking them to enter into a relationship with me. And the challenge of any relationship is to overcome difference. Our human nature naturally labels anything different as the capital O other, which is something you don't have to engage with. You can keep it at, a, at an arm's length where it's safe. The alternative though, is to enter into a relationship with difference, which is very hard. A relationship means listening to difference. It means being open to difference. It means accepting that you don't know everything and that you might find out you're wrong about some things. This includes your understanding of your own race, your own gender, your own nation, your own creed, all the labels that shape your own identity. Everything has to be on the table in a real relationship. The poet David White sums it up by saying, no identity survives a real relationship. So it's much easier to label difference as the other, because which usually turns into fear of the other, because what we're really fearing is having to do all this difficult self-questioning of a relationship. So I use curiosity to disarm this difference. Again, I'm trespassing with curiosity because curiosity allows people to ease into that state of vulnerability. And it allows me to ask questions free of judgment. Why do you cook that way? How did you make that? What's that plant called? I've never seen that plant before. Why did you build your house that way? We have different construction methods in the US. The key to all this though, is it has to be genuine curiosity. Because when people sense falseness, they feel you violated their trust and they immediately close off the private space, which exactly, is exactly what I'm trying to avoid. My challenge is that I have to genuinely be interested in these people. My goal then is to use curiosity to create a vulnerable space in which we can build a relationship and to hold that space open for long enough to create a photograph. As I've been working, I've been taking increasing uh, inspiration from a guy named Andy Goldsworthy. Andy is a Scottish sculptor who makes these elaborate structures from the natural materials he finds in a particular location, rocks, stones, leaves, whatever he finds. He spends all day building these, these elaborate sculptures and then releases them back into nature and watches nature's forces dismantle it back into nothing. And that may seem a little disheartening that after a long day's work, you have nothing to show for your efforts. But he says his work is not really the sculpture. Rather, his, sculpture, his work is to make visible the invisible forces of nature, wind, heat, light, what he calls the flow of nature. And his structures are really only catalysts that are only necessary to allow us to see and understand these forces that dictate our lives, but that we can't really see. And the action of these uh, forces against his sculpture is the way we can understand that. 
In his words, the real work is the change. And I see my work in that same vein, that despite all this effort to transport my equipment, set up my camera, and then go home, process my film, and then hopefully maybe be able to track these people down and mail them a, a thank you print, my real work is not the photograph. My real work is the change in our relationship that I can see in front of the camera, the relationship that happens in the 20 minutes we're together and in the 10 minutes of exposure. So I'll leave it there and uh, you can email me if you like and further conversation. I look forward to that. And thank you very much to Fulbright for allowing me to present. Thank you, thank you all so much for your insightful presentations. Now I do ask if all presenters can come back on screen. Let us see. Hey, Alicia, you. Yes? sorry to interrupt you. Uh, Kath, uh, Kathy's here. Oh, Kathy, great. Um, yeah, Kathy. I was trying. I was trying very hard. I was here right on time, but nothing happened. So I'm ready to present. Perfect, perfect. Go ahead and share your screen, and I'll go off screen. Okay, hold on. How's that? You look great. Good. You tell me when you want me to start. Yeah, we are, the floor is yours. Perfect. Greetings, everyone. Thank you. Our presentation, Changing Minds, Women's Travel Writing and International Projects, provides reports on three different projects. I will present for myself and two colleagues who could not be here for the session. First, you'll hear an overview of my, Kathleen Bowgley's forthcoming book, Letters to My Father, Excavating a Jewish Identity in Poland and Belarus. Second, a report from Marla Rauscher Osborne, jurist, doctor, currently working and living in Lviv, Ukraine, on her work as a founder of the Rohatan Jewish Heritage, a nonprofit organization that develops heritage preservation projects to reconnect the 400 year old history of Rohatan's now lost Jewish community with the modern Ukrainian city. And finally, Professor Sherry L. Rosenthal on her travels and two published survivor stories. Our first presentation, particularly relevant during this time when racial identity and social justice are at the forefront of our national and international news, my book tells the story of a personal connection to immigration, ethnic and racial identity, a story of hidden foreign origins, which resonates in a world again facing the scourge of so-called racial purity. My memoir begins with my childhood discovery of my father's hidden Jewish identity and the implicit prohibition of speaking about it within my family or in the outside world. Disturbed by the uncharacteristic attitude of my otherwise unprejudiced and social justice minded parents, I sought to learn more about my own Jewish heritage and identity. Desiring to immerse myself in the historically terrorized heart of wartime Europe and epicenter of Jewish suffering, I applied for and was awarded a Fulbright scholarship to teach in communist Poland. That was 1987 to 89, where I also witnessed at close range the ongoing controversy concerning Polish anti-Semitism, Poland's collusion during the war, and the country's treatment of its Jewish citizens, both before and after the war. In the state archives of Poland and Belarus, I uncover the lives and deaths of my ancestors in Brest, Belarus, formerly Brzezhd, Poland, or Breslitovsk, Poland. Throughout my book, Beshirt, the Yiddish word for destiny, uncannily guides me to uncover deeply hidden stories. My father, who had said he would not travel to Poland to visit me, changed his mind after reading my letters about my discoveries in the land of his birth. Touring the country together with my father and mother, my father and I find a way to heal the rift between us. From very early in my life, I yearned to know my family's stories, the family's places, 
Jews. But my father's veiling of his original birthplace, along with his Jewish identity, never ceased to both trouble me and fuel my drive to learn about his former world. My memoir, Letters to My Father, chronicles the journey begun in my childhood to uncover the curtain over my father's identity, the place he came from, and thus my own identity and origins. After the finish of my Fulbright in June 1989, this was the time of Tiananmen Square and also the coming down of the wall and the eventual fall of the wall, research in the history of Jewish Poland began to surge and with it, the question of Polish anti-Semitism was finally addressed. It was a renaissance of knowledge, Polish self-awareness, history, honesty, that lasted from 1989 to 2005. In 2005, the Law and Justice Party, a right-wing national conservative populist Christian party, won the national election. With the coming to power of this reactionary government, a campaign of denial of Poland's full and true history was begun. Still in power today, this regime seeks to suppress all research on Polish Jewish history and current relations. Now to our second presentation by Juris Dr. Marla Rosher Osborne. In 2011, Marla and her husband Jay together founded the volunteer organization Rohatan Jewish Heritage, which in 2016 became a registered Ukrainian nonprofit NGO. RJH Today initiates and manages a number of physical heritage preservation and education projects aimed at reconnecting the 400 year history of Rohatan's now lost Jewish community with the people and places of the modern Ukrainian city. Many projects, including the cooperation of current Rohatan residents and volunteers from around the world. Projects include rehabilitation and maintenance of Rohatan's Jewish heritage sites, two cemeteries, two wartime mass graves, recovery and databasing of Jewish headstones looted during World War II, documentation of former Jewish community-owned religious and education buildings, as well as Holocaust testimonies and memories, identification of Ukrainian righteous, and development of educational materials integrating local Jewish and Ukrainian histories. Since inception, RJH has recovered more than 600 Jewish headstone fragments from around the town and returned them to Rohatan's old Jewish cemetery. In May 2017, RJH arranged and financed a professional survey of three Jewish mass grave sites in town with the goal of determining the grave's physical boundaries to the extent possible after 75 years to document, protect, and officially memorialize the spaces. A supplemental survey of the North Mass Grave was conducted in May 2019, following receipt of new historical information pertinent to the site. From 2017 to 18, RJH worked with the city of Rohatton to create a permanent exhibition of Rohatton's pre-war Jewish community for Opelia, a small but dense regional museum which opened in November 2018. RJH held several so-called volunteer days in 2017, 2018, and 2019, cutting and clearing at the Jewish cemeteries in Rohatton, which included Ukrainian and European friends and activists, Americans with Peace Corps Ukraine, the U.S.-based Christian organization, the Matsiva Foundation, as well as Rohatan residents and students. For 2020 to 2021, RJH has been continuing the seasonal clearings at Rohatan's Jewish sites with smaller war crews. There is a robust Rohatan Jewish Heritage website, which is 100% bilingual English and Ukrainian, and presents, among other things, local Jewish history and culture, topical historical timelines, memoirs and testimonies, project status, events, news, and heritage, heritage tourism information. For the period 2019, June to 2020, Marla was a Fulbright U.S. Research Scholar. I'd like now, if we can, to turn to the third presentation by Dr. Sherry Rosenthal. 
As Fulbright at 75 celebrates global friendship, I'd like first to acknowledge my fellow panelists, Dr. Kathleen Bowgley and Marla Rauscher Osborne. Together and separately, our presentations underscore the importance of women's travel, writing and friendship, synergistic endeavors of inner and outer discovery and abundant worth. My Fulbright lecture post in American literature at Central University of Barcelona from 1983 to 85 allowed me to also visit Hungary, Poland, and Germany, travel that proved invaluable when I came to co collaborate with two Holocaust survivors, one Hungarian and the other German, and to help them write their memoirs in English. When my friend Kathy Bowgley won a Fulbright grant to Silesian University in Sosnowiec, Poland, I visited her there. She took me to the Auschwitz concentration camp where I stood, literally, in the same place as a former teenage prisoner and survivor I hadn't yet met, Stephen Nasser of Budapest. Later, Mr. Nasser and I collaborated on his memoir, My Brother's Voice, How a Young Hungarian Boy Survived the Holocaust, Stephen's Press, 2003. This book has sold over 50 thousand copies and today is used widely as a high school and college Holocaust textbook. In 2013, it was also translated into German and published in Germany. Closer to home, in 2013, I collaborated with another Holocaust survivor, my aunt Irene Rosenthal, formerly of Sforzheim, Germany. Her memoir, Run, Run, Hitler is Coming, How a Young German Girl Escaped the Holocaust, is one I use in addition to my brother's voice in a course I teach at the College of Southern Nevada Holocaust and Genocide Literature. Without the travel and international outreach opportunities Fulbright gave me in the 80s, I would have possessed neither the confidence nor the necessary understandings of Eastern Europe to do justice to either of these collaborations. Of our three panel members, I was the first to receive a Fulbright Award in 1983. Dr. Kathleen Bowgley became a grantee in 1987. Marla Rauscher Osborne received her award most recently in 2019, 2020, 37 years after me. Today though, we are here together to form this panel, women writers, travelers, and friends. Each of us aims to accomplish work that changes minds through international projects. Hopefully, and thanks to Fulbright, endeavors like ours bring the world closer and perhaps contribute to making it a wiser, more discerning place. Thank you. And Kathy, I'm gonna include the links to some of the things you mentioned, some books in the, ch in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bagley. That was amazing. Um, I will now again invite all presenters to turn their cameras on. We have about 50 minutes or so for some Q&A. Perfect. Great. So I have a couple of questions that came in through the chat and then also privately to me. So I will start with um, Carla. I'll start it off with you. Um, I think you answered this question a little bit in the in the Q and A. But for those that are watching the video, what does the does the country definition of Simon and Hole's conflict with the free does it conflict with the Freedom Index that we see in the international business textbooks? So that's part one of the question. And part two is, please clarify how you would measure world order since you had it as a column or as a category within the Good Country Index. Okay, thank you, Alicia. And thank you, Jay, for the clarification as well. That was helpful. So first of all, I'd like to clarify that I'm not using the theory of the country, good country equation completely. I'm not taking the values of the countries or any of the factors that they're taking into account. I'm just using the core idea that it represents, which is countries collaborating for the well-being of the society instead of competing. So that said, um, I don't think the good country equation conflicts with the freedom index because the freedom index is more focused on what the country does nationally regarding freedom of expression, freedom of religion, and some other basic rights. 
whereas the good country equation measures the contributions of the country to the world, to international, um, the, the international arena without bearing in mind specifically the national laws or um, legislation, what they contribute, what they measure as the contributions to peace and well-being, to security, to climate, to world order as well. And to be more specific, some of the contributions that might be under world order, I don't know exactly because they're not listed anywhere. They're just under you know, the secret and measurement of the index. But um, by the explanation of the different sections, I believe that the contributions of work to the world order are the ones that are related to international justice legislation, such as collaboration for the International Justice Court or some other international organizations that are working to maintain world order. I hope that answers the questions. Otherwise, feel free to ask again in the chat or in the questions. Thanks so much, Paula. Um, the next question I have is for Andreas. Um, so before executing strategic doing as a group, do we first agree on what the goal or objective is beforehand? That's part one. And then I have a second question, which is, how could your principles apply to helping our chapters grow? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much uh, for the two uh, questions. I think Jay and, uh, asked the first question in the chat. Um, so when we get into the, the process of thinking about applying strategic doing, it's usually um, one or two key uh, people like the initiators, the ones who want to address a certain uh, complex challenge. And they work together uh, with someone who knows the, the framework of strategic doing and they work on this appreciative question. And then once you have an appreciative question, it usually goes into like two or three cycles of refining it because it should really capture the imagination of other people. You then send out the question usually to maybe around 10 or 20 people max. And then you, you wait for the replies and the ones who, who, uh, who reply are usually the ones who would love to you know, participate and be part of this new thing. And they, it really captured their imagination. So that's when you start to work with them. It's usually a small group of like five to six people because that's really effective and they are sort of the, the, inner, the inner group and then they can be boundary spanners and more and more people can get involved um, in regards to the challenge that you want to solve. And um, the, the, section, the second question um, in regards to how, how you might use strategic doing to help uh, the, the chapters, um, I actually used, or we used strategic doing when, when COVID uh, arised because um, it posed many challenges onto our usual formats. And it can really help to, to do some, um, to do some creative, um, some creative, um, yeah, to start some creative process because the people bring in all the assets that they have um, and you can really try to uncover those assets and combine them in new ways. So things that could come out of a strategic doing workshop could be new formats to engage members, new ways to maybe even organize yourselves and um, you, you um, uncover opportunities to maybe invite a speaker or something like that. So um, I hope that answers uh, the question and um, thank you so much. Thank you, Andreas. Okay, so Dr. Trinai, this question is for you. How has your definition of home changed since completing your research? We can't hear you, just unmute, Dr. Yep. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much for the question, Alicia. Um, I, I think like many of us, um, that definition has changed a lot for me, especially um, we in the Fulbright community, right? We uh, move around, we make home in new places. Um, I think it, um, in the sense of home for me, um, of course, it was never static because I grew, was born and raised in Vietnam and I came to the US in, when I was 19 years of age. And then I moved to Sweden. I went to um, on the Fulbright Fellowship when I was 19. So 
uh, when I was 30. So that was the second time that I made a big change in my uh, residence. Um, my experience and my research in Sweden had challenged me um, to think about home as a static place um, because in the Vietnamese culture, home is very attached to the land. You know, there's a very sense, there's a very strong sense of attachment to the ancestral land and uh, the hometown where your family came from. Um, but for me, um, the Fulbright experience has opened up for me the uh, different ways of um, creating home, feeling at home. Um, I didn't have a chance to um, share um, one of the situational uh, community uh, that I that I um, experienced in Sweden, but that had to do with um, the time um, a young student from uh, Uppsala University invited me to come on a dance rehearsal with her to Osta, uh, a suburb in Stockholm. So we took the train, we went there, and then um, to my surprise, um, we met with three elderly ladies um, who would be in the dance team. So there's this young 20 some year old girl counting in Chinese um, and playing you know, to a Vietnamese song and with three elderly ladies blending dancing. Um, so one surprise after another, it was getting dark, it was snowing. Um, the, one of the ladies offered to drive us back to Tia Central, and which is uh, in Stockholm, where then from there we can take the metro home. So instead of us ha having to take the local train, you know, going all the way back from the suburb to the center of town. So we got into her car, it was snowing, it was dark, and then she was still very upbeat and she was, she was, she was swinging around, she was singing still, and at one point she was like, I wonder where we are. And so that was not reassuring for me because I didn't know where that was either, but um, it was, uh, I kept thinking about, um, you know, this, my safety and, you know, when this whole trip would end, but eventually we, we did get to Tia Central. And, but as, you know, um, scary as that experience might have been at some point, um, I felt a sense of home being with these elderly lady, even though they were speaking Chinese, uh, because I think it's just that sense of being together with other women, with other people, with other immigrants. Um, so that's one of the situational communities that I encounter. And that's, these ladies gave me a sense of home. Um, so I hope that is an allusion to the question that you ask. Um, it has changed a lot. And it's about not so much about a space, even though space is still important, but it's also about the community and the people that you are with and not in the idealized sense of, you know, like perfect love and, you know, family structure, but it's also about the connections you make with other people. That's beautiful. I really, really appreciate that answer. Thank you so much. Um, Joe, we have a question for you. So you showed us um, many great photographs. Is there one or more? photos that really stand out to you that maybe you connect with more than others and if so can you explain why well of course i like all of them uh i think maybe one particular is a what ended up being a double exposure may may not remember which one i'm speaking of but it's a portrait of a woman in black and white um and it was one i made by accident by exposing two images on top of each other um and i didn't know that until i got home and realized that i had messed it up supposedly and it was one that i was really hard for me not to break my own rule of don't throw anything away because your initial impression of something might be different later on you might discover something brand new in it that you didn't see immediately and is one one that people often respond to positively so just on a personal level it's one that reminds me that there is no such thing as a mistake and i hold on to it um, and years later i still go back and find new pictures that i that i enjoy so I think just embracing um, anything that is surprising and letting go of any kind of predetermined outcome that I may or may not have with not just this, but everything. Uh, that's probably the biggest lesson that I learned personally from it. But of course, all the pictures have their own special reasons why I like them. Right, and someone did ask in the chat and I know that you responded, but if you can just um, reiterate what you said regarding the fact that you did not use um, digital, you used film, and why is that? Uh, and this project started at that transition when film was kind of becoming obsolete, Kodak was going bankrupt, um, and they were not making much of the materials anymore. 
Um, so I had two choices after the camera that I initially used became fairly obsolete. Uh, it was a medium sized camera, what's called a medium format camera. And the choice is either to go a, a smaller handheld camera, which was the domain of the digital world, or to uh, go the large camera, which is the domain of the people who like the, the old processes, the handheld processes. And as a mechanical person myself, that was the part that I was more inclined to. And then I say it initially started from interest alone. Uh, but then I realized that the camera itself is its own sense of diplomacy, because uh, if you've not seen the kind of camera, it's, it's eight by 10 inches. So it's a standard sheet of paper that is the, uh, the, the, the sheet of film that I'm exposing. So it's a giant box that I can actually engage the people and they're curious about what it is. So I can have them come behind the camera and see the image. They won't be able to see the image of themselves, which is, I guess, conceptually the idea is that you can't see the future. You can only see the present. So they can see their, uh, the picture that I might make of their friend and see how cool it is to operate that, that uh, object, that, that, the, the tactility of that. Uh, and that becomes a way of bridging my world with their world is that I can't necessarily show them the result. I can't introduce them to my world here, art world, all these other worlds that are separate from theirs. But we can enjoy that, that excitement of seeing light coming through a lens to seeing how it transforms shapes and, and space and see how their friends look through this object. So uh, not only do I enjoy the process of making it, but the process of uh, being in the mo moment with them is more engaging in that sense. As, as long as I'm careful not to let them hold things and drop things and that kind of thing, but that, that ends up being my, my, my parent job as well to learn how to uh, allow people to participate responsibly and to try to teach them uh, how to operate these things without putting me, myself at risk in, in that sense. Uh, but again, the, the, the main question I think that in the chat was that I don't want to be distracted. I don't want them to be distracted with whether the picture came out good or bad because they have a preconceived notion, and so do I, about what a good picture is. And I want both of us to disconnect from that. I want us to just kind of sense any kind of preconceived notions photographically or culturally or anything else and really just enjoy the shared exchange that we're having and discover what that means. It's a brand new discovery, what that exchange is for me, every single person that I engage with. And if I can separate myself with, oh, I really want a picture because I'm going to be able to do X, Y, Z with it and them as well, then we can really enjoy each other and discover our personalities and who we are. Thanks for sharing, Joe. Thank you. Um, the last question, Dr. Kathleen, uh, what was the most unexpected insight you have as a result of your research on your own Jewish identity? Kathy, I think you're muted. Okay. Okay, we can hear you now. Okay, yeah, I was on, yeah. yeah, okay. I'm unmuted by, by Alicia. Okay, thank you, Alicia. Yeah, you know, it's a really good question because what was really stunning for me in my travels, you know, and, and I don't know if it became clear in what I had to say, but there were two parts to it. There was the Fulbright itself, during the communist period where I lived on my own for two years, right before the wall came down and when Tiananmen Square happened. And then my going back much later to Poland and Belarus, back to the archives, the word Bashir, this has become so important to me. It's a, it's a Yiddish word, variously translated, but essentially means destiny. It got to the point where the things I was finding were so much like needles and haystacks, the likelihood of my finding, uh, you know, it seemed impossible. I was with a guide in Belarus, and at one point she looked at me and just kind of shivered and said, I've brought a lot of people along these things, but I have never seen anyone with this kind of luck. Um, so I guess the insight was that I felt, without getting too into the mystic, <laughs> I felt guided in a way. The things that I was able to uncover in the short amount of time that I was there were stunning. I've learned my whole family tree. I have found what, you know, what happened to those who were annihilated and were murdered. I went to the places where that happened. And again, the likelihood of finding those was so remote. And yet in every case, it happened. 
Thank you. I wish we had more time for questions. We have so many good ones. Um, but this is all the time that we do have. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And thank you to our presenters. Thank you for um, to our audience for attending this session. Um, this session will be recorded and it, we will share a link with you all soon. Um, we hope to see you back tomorrow, 9.30 a.m. Eastern time for session four, health, housing, and social values. Um, until then, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone.